Between 12 and 2 p.m., news, religious, and war programming filled the radio dial. Standouts included the Salt Lake City Tabernacle Choir and Organ at noon on CBS, Soldiers of the Press at 12.30 p.m. on Mutual, and the Chicago Roundtable at 1.30 p.m. on NBC. I'd been in New York for uh, 12 or 14 years before I went to California. Actually, it was, we got back to the Philadelphia story again. It was during our layoff in the summer when Catherine Hepburn went to the coast to make the movie. Well, I went with my old friend Orson Welles into his first picture, which was called Citizen Kane. So while Catherine Hepburn was making the Philadelphia story in uh, Hollywood, I was working in my first movie with Orson and the Mercury Theater, Citizen Kane. And then, after we completed those pictures, uh, Catherine hers and I finished my uh -huh. stint in Citizen Kane, we went back and went on tour. Getting back to you and Orson Welles and your film career really started when Orson apparently brought you to Hollywood. Of course, that was the first picture any of us had ever made. Uh, there were very few people in that picture. You were all stage actors and yeah. uh, radio people yeah, by that time. we were. And none of us uh, knew what we were doing. Orson did, of course. Uh -huh. He'd been out there two years studying his craft and trying to find the right picture to do. We were all innocents. Mm. Maybe that was the, su the well, maybe, success maybe, well, of the picture. Well, maybe uh, it doesn't always work out that way, that it turns out that it's better if you don't know what you're doing. Uh -huh. But that was, yeah. <laughs> it was, it was But we had good guidance, I must say. Well, you uh, followed up with The Magnificent Ambersons in 42, and that was directed by Orson Welles. Right, and he, Orson did the adaptation of that, too. Uh -huh. And then you continued to be guided, if, I, if that's the right word, by Mr. Welles, Journey into Fear with... Orson Welles and uh, yeah, Orson and I wrote that together. You wrote that too. Yes. Oh, did you do? You mentioned it before. Oh, I adapted Mercury it. Adapted theaters, it uh -huh. rather. Yes, yeah. but it would tell you that that kind of radio doesn't exist today. I don't know what happened to it. I miss it. I figured out once that I'd been on more than three thousand dramatic radio shows. For protection today and progress tomorrow, look to Lockheed for leadership. Hollywood, California, the men and women who build Lockheed Aircraft present America's Ceiling Unlimited, written by Harry Cronman, starring Joseph Cotton. With songs by Constance Moore, music by Wilbur Hatch, is orchestra and chorus. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we bring you one of the stars you will see in David O. Selznick's newest production, Since You Went Away. The star of America Ceiling Unlimited, Joseph Cotton. Thank you. Thank you, and a very happy Easter to you all. Yes, it's Easter again. It's spring, and music is in the air, so you'll agree it's only natural that the first of our weekly questions should be What is America singing? And natural, too, that Constance Moore, looking very pretty, if you please, in her new Easter outfit, should be on hand to supply the answer. Come in, Connie. Lovely things to do on Easter Sunday. First, we'd walk around the corner to the church. And... Ceiling Unlimited began as a series of informative dramas by Orson Welles in November 1942. It was sponsored by Lockheed Vega Aircrafts and showcased aviation's role in the war. Welles walked out in February of 1943 after a blow up with one of the ad agency men. 
author James Hilton took over. It became a Hollywood variety series in August 1943. Joseph Cotton hosted, with Patrick McGeehan as announcer, and both Connie Moore and Nan Wynn providing vocal arrangements by Wilbur Hatch. This Easter Sunday episode took to the air at 2 p.m. from WABC, which at that time were still the call letters for CBS's New York affiliate. The Blue Network's New York flagship, WJZ, aired Chaplin Jim USA, while WEAF aired a play called Those We Love. Mail, ladies and gentlemen, is today available to those of us who live in large cities, whose homes are near commercial airline stops. But the day is coming, after the war is won, when every city and every town and every hamlet will be connected by air mail. And when that day comes, it will bring with it an entirely new concept of written communication. All first class mail will be truly first class. It will be air mail. And whether you live in Schenectady or Sauk Center, the letter you post will span the nation overnight. Today, the men and women of Lockheed are building planes for war. Tomorrow, after victory, they will build the planes of peace, the planes that will bring you all first-class mail by air. God's own starry canopy, where crosses stand so silently, our boy is sleeping. No more to fly in rain. Or Listen, sun. Americans. Listen to a father reciting a poem. I'm sure you've never heard of him. He runs a little grocery in New York. But listen to a mother, too. A very famous lady whom you've heard of frequently. She also knows the words. And a miner in the Pennsylvania hills. And a school teacher in Kentucky. The banker in Duluth. Yes, they all know the words, we are not weeping. Words they have, that have brought them comfort and hope and welded them together into a nationwide fellowship of faith. The words of a simple, tender poem, Hymn to a Hero, by Joseph S. Lovett of Bruton, Alabama. The Lovitz had a son, Little Joe, they called him. Only Little Joe was big enough to go to war, one of the first to go, in fact, on the very first convoy that sailed for Australia. And when the chips were down over New Guinea in the early days when the Zeros outnumbered us ten to one, Little Joe was big enough to die. Father Joe believed that his son went out doing the thing he wanted to do, 
and that it was up to him to carry on. So, in pride and faith, not in grief, he wrote a poem. And hoping that its words might bring consolation to others, he began to mail copies to parents who, like himself, had given their sons. Letters full of thanks and gratitude came pouring back to him in Bruton. Slowly, the gentle words he wrote found their way about the land until, in New York, Fred Waring came upon them and had his brother Tom set them to music. And today, Easter Sunday... Constance Moore, with Wilbur Hatch's orchestra and the Lockheed Chorus, bring you Him to a Hero. A message of comfort, a tribute of love, of abiding faith that we shall meet again. All those boys we've loved and lost for just a little while.
What is America reading? America is reading endless real-life stories of the accomplishments and heroism of our boys on the battlefronts of the world. Today, we have Lockheed are reminded of a story we told you during the last Easter season. Last year, when we had scarcely any victories to soften the harshness of our defeats. Your letters indicate you not only remember it, but you want to hear it again this year. And so, with Agnes Moorhead as our special guest, we bring it to you now. A story titled appropriately for this Easter Sunday, God's Corporals. Farron, Some America is a little town, high school, post office, railroad station, a typical small town, quite undistinguished from all other small towns, and somewhere on an ordinary street, an ordinary little home. I think you know the house I mean. It needs a coat of paint, a coat of paint that's lying in a dresser drawer upstairs, four $50 bonds. There's a bed of tulips by the weathered porch. A clump of lilacs splashed with lavender, a picket fence whose gate inevitably hangs a little out of line. Pa Johnson plans to fix that gate someday, someday when he gets another helper at the shop, when he's not as tired as he is just now. Covering a yawn, he puts his evening paper down, looks at his watch, and starts the nightly ritual of calling it a day. Nine o'clock, Martha. Getting pretty late. Martha. Oh. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Henry. I've got to be up at six, you know. Yes, yes, I know. You go along. I'll be right in. Reading that letter again, are you? Well, I I thought maybe there was something I might have missed. Anything in that letter you missed, I'll bet it was written in invisible ink. Just see you don't fall asleep over it, Mom. No, I won't. No more than you did last night, huh? Oh, Henry. (laughs) All right, all right. You stay and read your letter. This is one old rooster that's going to (laughs) root. Don't forget to turn the lights out, Martha. Hmm. Dear Ma and Dad, it sure looks like little Davy's getting around these days. Practically the other side of the world. I guess Australia seems a long way off to you. It did to me, too. But that's how it is in this man's army. Keep at it, Ma Johnson. Read through it again. Every sentence, every word, every careless little mark. Read it and read it and read it again. Because you're right, you know. You've missed a lot of things in that letter. Have I? Of course. The things he didn't say. I know. He always writes so generally. I try to read between the lines. No, the things I mean are in the words themselves. The crossing of a T, perhaps. The dotting of an I. A little comma carrying a story in its tail. I'm sorry. I I don't understand you when you talk like that. He didn't mention Boone Mission, did he? No, I don't think so. That's in New Guinea, you know, on the North Shore. Boone Mission? A, A sorry little place in a jungle clearing. It's wet and soggy on the day, I mean. But the rain has stopped. That's why they're coming over. You can hear them coming over now. Who's coming over? They always come over on days like these. Zeros. Coming over to Strand. That's why those boys are running for cover. With that fringe of palms, it's very difficult to run in mud like this. Soft, slimy hands that cling to you and make each step an endless, agonizing struggle against time. <laughs> I'm afraid one of them is hit. Why, David? You mustn't worry. Your David is all right. You're sure? You have my word for it. <gasps> Thank you. You see, it isn't just that he's mine. David's such a good boy. He was always good, even when he was little. Of course, sometimes he didn't wash his ears, and maybe some nights he didn't say his prayers. He says them now. You know, I rather think your David is on friendly speaking terms with God. He is? You can see for yourself if you wish, if you promise not to worry. I promise. All right. Your David is lying on the ground. He's hurt. You promise. Oh, he... It slipped. Don't stop now, please. He's lying on the ground. The sergeant from the medical corps is there. The company aide. The captain, too. They're doing everything they can for him. Machine gun slug, Captain. Looked pretty bad hole in the shoulder. Anybody see him get it? I did, sir. I was with him. We was running for them palms. He sort of screamed. Then he said, dear God, and then he dropped. I lugged him in. Nice going. 
We'd better get him to the portable hospital, sir. Can't do much out here except a little sulfur powder and a shot of morphine. Where'd you get that morphine? We've been out for days. Got plenty now, sir. They flew it in this morning. David! David! He's gone. He's gone. You shouldn't have spoken to him. But you are still here. And you were there. You were the captain, weren't you? It's possible. Then you know what David said. Dear God. Tell me, would you say that was a prayer? Of course. You're sure? Those two short words? Sometimes the deepest prayers are never put in words at all. I'm glad. God will take care of my David now. Yes, God will take care of him. And all God's corporals, of course. His corporal? Well, sometimes God needs a little help. That medical sergeant, for example. Oh, the captain, too? The captain, too. Confidentially, he's just another corporal. God's army is pretty big, you know. All sorts of people in it. Those natives over there. God's corporals on a jungle trail. God's corporals? They're hardly wearing any clothes. God doesn't ask for formal dress and heat like this. New Guinea heat is just as sticky as New Guinea mud. That's no excuse. They're just a lot of savages. Perhaps. But it's a funny thing. Their language hasn't any word for hate. You know, it's a risky job they're doing. With all those snipers hidden in the trees and... Yet how carefully they're carrying that litter. A litter? Where would they get a litter from? Oh... Another corporal brought that in, Corporal Smith. He wears a first lieutenant's bars. He flew that letter in from outside, just so they could carry David in. My David? Your David now. Another David, another time. David! Don't worry. Those natives know the jungle trails, the secret paths that wind through great green barriers, through matted growth where no white man has ever been. They'll get your David in all right. Please. Where are they taking him? Emergency hospital number 12, about a mile or so behind the lines. A small white sanctuary in a dark green hell. A hospital in miniature, planted in the jungle's festering mold. A crisp, efficient doctor and his well-trained aide. Your David on the operating table is in good hands. Transfusion for shock completed, sir. Good work, Paul. Hemostat? Hemostat. Forceps? Forceps. Sponge? Sponge. I'm just doing a temporary fix so we can pass him on. Yes, sir. You know, I keep wondering what would happen to these fellows if we weren't here. Well, I guess they must have thought of that, too. Who, sir? The men who flew this hospital in. Beds, medicines, instruments, sterilizers, that blood plasma you just used. Yes, sir. They sure are doing a wonderful job. I'll say. If it wasn't for this doggone heat, I'd think I was operating back in Chicago. Doctor! Doctor, will he... They're gone. They're gone again. Well, maybe you shouldn't interrupt God's corporals at work. The doctor? Yes. It's all so strange. You're here... And yet I saw you there. I'm sure you were the doctor that I saw. Perhaps it's possible. For your David, I've been a lot of things. And now? Now, well, your David's on the road. A road? If you can call it that, a very narrow road cut through the dense undergrowth. A road they made almost by hand. A road for all Davids like your own. Hey, take it easy, Mike. You know that kid's shoulder's pretty bad. This jeep don't ride like no ambulance. What do you expect on a corduroy road? Think you're ro- rolling down Broadway? <laughs> Could be. Maybe they brought in everything else. Well, lucky, lucky they flew this jeep in here. Yeah, I guess it's a break for the kid at that. Be curtains for him if he had to walk these five miles. <laughs> a ride they don't picnic either. Feels like a pogo stick with a rumble seat. Hey, look out there. What a hole. Be careful, please. Dear, I shouldn't have. I I didn't mean to, really. It doesn't matter now. (sighs) Thank you. Those men, weren't they God's corporals, too? Corporals without stripes. But they are corporals. Oh, yes. They and the men who put their blood and sweat into the road and all the others, naturally. 
The ones who built the strip. The strip? I'm afraid I don't understand again. It's very simple. Six miles down the road, you'll find a long, wide strip. And that strip was cut right from the jungle's heart. They chopped it out and leveled it and pounded it until a plane could land. That plane that's waiting now. The plane that's going to take your David off. Easy now. Right. Careful how you put him on that plane. That's it. You sure to sink those straps? Steady now. Remember, he's wounded. Guess that does it, Major. You got a full load now. Right. Oh, well, Bob. Bob Adams. Call me, Major. They've been sending them down from Emergency 12. Just loaded the last one on your plane. Well, what are we waiting for? I'm sorry, Bob. I hate to rush you out again. Oh, forget it. I just dropped in here for a smoke. But six round trips in one day over those months. So what? I figure I've got a cinch. A cinch? Sure. Think of the guy that runs the subway shuttle in Times Square. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Take her away, Bob. They've gone. I didn't say a word, and they've gone. Yes, they have to hurry. That cargo of theirs is perishable. They're headed to the base now, over the mountains, to the south shore. Is it very far? Well, that depends on how you go. For wounded men on foot, it might be torture, wading through those jungle swamps. A hopeless march of inches through an eternity of pain. I, I doubt if many would get through. And David? You're David's with God's corporals, remember. They'll put him down in Moresby for the night, and then tomorrow, on another plane, an army transport to Australia. Australia? And are there corporals there, too? Of course, a whole brigade of them doing God's work. Doctors, nurses, orderlies. They'll make your David very comfortable. And he'll get well? You had a letter several days ago. Last Saturday, I... Oh, of course. He said Australia. And all this must have happened before. He's getting well. Yes, he's getting well. He's getting well because they cut the jungle back. Because they brought him drugs to ease the shock and terror of his wound. Because they brought a doctor with his blessed instruments. Because they brought a litter and a jeep. He's getting well because they picked him up and carried him away, far off, to a spacious, sunny hospital, a quiet room, a crisp, white, anesthetic cleanliness, where he'll forget the jungle and the fever and the mud in which he dropped. He'll live. Yes, he'll live. He'll live because man taught himself to fly. Wake up. Uh, huh? <laughs> Not much you didn't fall asleep and dreaming, too, from the sound of it. No. No, it was too real to be a dream. Henry, has David ever written you a letter that I didn't see? Well, just a note. He sent it to the shop. I, uh, I guess he was banged up a little more. Oh, nothing serious. He's getting well. Yes. Yes, I know. They flew to him with medicine and with a doctor, too. And then they picked him up and carried him through the skies. Who did? He said they were God's corporals. Who's he? I... Oh, Henry, I don't think you'd understand. I'm just asking who. Well, I suppose you'd call them angels, Henry. Oh. Oh. It has been said that man assumes a special dignity among animals because he dreams of the future as well as of the past. Our dream, I must admit, has very humble origins. Our dream is rooted in a little home that needs a coat of paint, four war bonds and a dresser drawer, the suffering of an injured boy, the stubborn courage of the men who fought their way to him and saved his life, a single precious human life. Yes, that's the beginning of a dream. Perhaps you'd like to hear the end. In days to come, a world at peace again. 
And in that time, great hospital ships that rise and fly wherever there is need. In crisis or catastrophe, in earthquake or in fire or flood, no place on earth too far, no corner of the world too distant or remote for those great healing wings. This is a dream we have. And we of Lockheed here dedicate our labor and our skills to the fulfillment of this dream, especially on this Easter day. For we believe that out of all this sacrifice and death, some great and lasting good must come to all mankind. That out of death must come the resurrection. next Sunday, this is Joseph Cotton speaking for the men and women of Lockheed and inviting you to tune in then. This program was a presentation of the Lockheed Aircraft Corporation of Burbank, California. Patrick McGeehan speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.